He is currently Professor of Philosophy and Canada Research Chair in Political Philosophy at Queen's University, where he's taught since 1998, and he's, and he's incredibly prolific. He's uh, written eight books, and as, as many of you know, he is the author of uh, Zoopolis, uh, Political Theory and Animal Rights, which he, wrote, with, which he co-wrote with his wife. And tonight he's going to be presenting to us on uh, the question of the intersection between the left and animal rights, and why animal animal rights is seen as a non-issue in leftist circles, and how this can be amended. So I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Kimuka. <laughs> thanks, Victoria. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, so I, I want to talk about some tensions between the animal rights uh, movement and other social justice movements. Uh, and how they might be addressed. Uh, it might help if I just step back uh, for a second and say a few words about how I see the current state of the animal rights movement, which, um, to drastically oversimplify, I view as essentially a, a failure. Um, so we've had more or less 40, 40 years of organized animal advocacy, and there have been some um, victories, uh, like uh, you know, banning wild animals in some circuses, or uh, limiting some particularly egregious practices uh, like gestation crates, or uh, increasing penalties for <coughs> for animal cruelty, um, and and those those victories are, are reflective of I think some genuine change in public opinion. I, I think public opinion polls show that more people are aware of issues about animal welfare and uh, express some concern about them, which is why uh, referenda, we don't have many in Canada, but in the US, referenda on animal welfare issues have become more successful over the years. Uh, and that, in turn, is related to the presence of, of uh, active and well-funded animal advocacy groups. So all of that is, is true, and all of that is different from 40 years ago. And some people, if you want to be optimistic, you can, you can look at those changes and say things are getting better. Um, but my own view, as I said, is, is uh, that we've basically failed as a movement. Um, one reason, I think, is that, um, you know, sitting here amongst friends, uh, we look around and we see that there are, you know, we know people who are deeply committed to the cause um, <coughs> and, and who work actively on it. It's worth remembering that probably somewhere, maybe even at the same university, there's another group meeting uh, who are committed to finding new ways to exploit animals. Um, so, I mean, uh, certainly at my university, they're the whose job it is to figure out new ways to exploit animals. Uh, and what they're doing in some of the bio fields of biotechnology uh, involves a level of, of invasiveness and harm and instrumentalization of animals that's kind of staggering and, and well, well beyond... Uh, what was even possible 10 or 20 years ago. So we've been, I, so one other thing is, I, we've been winning a few victories on last century's abuse of animals, and, and we're falling way behind on this century's abuse of animals. Uh, it's hard to know how to weigh up these, these victories and losses, but uh, a simple measure is just the number, the sheer number of animals being harmed and killed for human benefit. I mean, presumably that's what the movement is about, is reducing the number of animals being harmed and killed for human benefit, and the numbers are, are much higher today than they were 40 years ago when Peter Singer's Animal Liberation was first published. And all the projections I've seen, and, and the UN and other organizations produce these projections, that there are going to be even more animals being harmed and killed and confined for human benefit 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 40 years from now. Um, no country, certainly not Canada, has uh, made a commitment to reducing the number of animals that it, it uh, 
arms and kills for human benefit, if you, if you think of the way countries are planning for the future, every country is still planning on basing a large part of their economy on the exploitation of animals. No country has renounced the, the right or the intention of, of continuing to exploit animals. Uh, and if you look at, at the, the number of people who think there's something wrong, they really think there's something wrong with that, that we don't, we don't have the right to build our society and economy on the exploitation of animals, it's, it's infinitesimally small. I mean, it's maybe 2% of the population in most Western democracies who think there's really something deeply wrong with, with harming uh, animals for our benefit. So that's, that's the sense which I think we've, the movement has been more or less a failure. Uh, I think that shouldn't be particularly surprising that, after all, all of us, uh, every, every member of society uh, benefits from the exploitation of animals. Uh, Dinesh Bodywal, in his forthcoming book, talks about how uh, the exploitation of animals generates this flow of pleasures for humans, and, and many people are strongly attached to the flow of pleasures we get from from exploiting animals, and many of those are quite intimate pleasures about, about what we eat, what we wear, uh, sources of entertainment, and so on, and people are just not uh, not keen to give them up, and moreover, those pleasures are sanctioned by, it's not just this kind of selfish pleasures, but those there is lots of cultural sanction for taking pleasure in, in uh, exploitation of animals. So various world religions seem to say that animals were put here to serve us. Capitalism tells us that it's okay to commodify animals and treat them as property. Various uh, secular philosophies say that animals lack the, the, the qualities that are the basis for, for moral respect. So, so there's a lot of cultural sanction for uh, the way we exploit animals. So it's not its not really surprising, I think, that the animal rights movement has failed to date. I actually think it's kind of over-determined, uh, the failure to date of the animal rights movement. What is surprising, so I don't find that surprising. What I do find surprising is that animal rights seems to have failed even on the left. Uh, that, that I find a bit more surprising and disappointing, is that so few people on the left have embraced the cause of animal rights. So John Sadamatsu uh, has a recent paper where he talks about that the left historically, uh, until today, has shown a more or less complete indifference to human violence against animals. And I think that's, that's an absolutely accurate uh, characterization of the left uh, for the past 20 years up, up until today. And, uh, and it's a bit surprising or, and, and disappointing because the left is part of the self-identity of the left to, to uh, be attentive to oppression and exploitation and to have, feel solidarity with other social justice movements. Uh, I mean, people on the left typically think of themselves as members of a family of social justice movements. And so even if they are themselves personally most concerned with, say, gay rights, they nonetheless uh, feel a sense of solidarity with uh, the, the struggles of the, the homeless, or indigenous peoples, or the immigrants, uh, uh, or women or people with disabilities, and you can see this on, you know, like on the websites of the major advocacy groups for for uh, these struggles. That say, if there's a, a a women's equality group, that's their main focus. But they will emphasize on their website that they uh, that they are committed to principles of uh, respect for gay rights, uh, accessibility for people with disabilities, uh, respect for indigenous rights. And, I mean, this, this, again, this is part of the self-identity of the left is to is to express one's, one expresses one's identity as a member of a larger family of social justice movements. Um, but if you look at those websites, virtually none of them will express sympathy for animal rights. So animal rights is invisible. Uh, it's just it's been excluded from the family of social justice movements. Um, so uh, so Blair French describes animal rights as the orphans of the left, and I think this is phrase that the animal rights emerged as part of uh, the kind of ferment of the 1960s of the part of the uh, various civil rights and social justice struggles of the 1960s and um, most people who were involved in animal rights came to it out of uh, another uh, social justice movement many people have in animal rights had their earlier were they involved in various human rights, uh, anti-racism uh, struggles, and so on, um, and they view their work on animal rights as continuous with their uh, earlier 
social justice campaigns, and, view, and they view themselves as part of a larger family of social justice movements, but they've been kind of uh, disavowed, disinherited from the family of social justice movements. Uh, okay, so so that's uh, the, the, the the problem that I see, and that, I, that it's this uh, this orphaning of uh, of the animal rights movement from the left. And um, I think it's both, it's a philosophical puzzle. I'm a philosopher, so I'm kind of, I'm interested in philosophical explanation for, for this phenomenon, but it's also a, it's a very serious political problem, I think, for the animal rights movement. So let me just say a few words about the philosophical puzzle, as I see it. Um, so the, I, I think it's puzzling, I find it puzzling that the left has disavowed animal rights, because I think all of the most important theoretical developments on the left in the last 40 years, 50 years, since the 1960s, um, should have pushed people on the left towards greater concern for animals. So uh, there's a lot to say about that, but let me just give you a couple of examples. So one, one important development on the left recently has been about how people on the left conceive of um, the good life for humans and the good society for humans. Um, so, if you go back to the old left, so go back to Marx, Karl Marx. So he he had a view about what was what was uh, what was valuable in a human life, what made a human life worth living. And his account, um, which is itself rooted in much older strands of philosophy and the West, said that what's what's most valuable about human life is what distinguishes human life from animal life. And so what distinguishes humans from other animals? For Marx, the answer was the ability of humans to transform the external world. So, um, yeah, so for Marx, what was distinctive, what, what the distinctive um, feature of humans as compared to other ants was our ability to transform the external world in accordance with some preconceived idea in our mind. So he has this famous passage, many of you may know it, but he says, what distinguishes uh, the, worst uh, the worst architect from the most sophisticated bees, it may be that the bees construct this honeycomb of unparalleled sophistication, and, but, what, but even the worst architect has a vision in his mind of what he's going to build before he builds it. And this is what, this is what makes us uniquely human, is our ability to transform the world in accordance with a, uh, a conscious idea. And so it's through creative, conscious, cooperative labor that we transform the world. Okay, so this is, many, many people describe this as Marx's Promethean vision of the human good. That like Prometheus, the, the, what, what makes our lives valuable is our ability to transform the external world, to remake it in our image, and thereby to transcend nature, to remake it. So, so on, on Marx's view, humans have that capacity, animals don't. Animals, therefore, are just part of the stage. They're part of the natural world, which is the stage on which we exercise our Promethean powers. And what, so one of the ways in which we express the human good is by transforming nature, including transforming animals. Domestication, experimentation, these, these are all forms of our, the Promethe exercise of our Promethean powers to transform the world. That's the way he thought was, was the good life. And so on Marx's view, there's a kind of radical discontinuity between <coughs> the good of human beings, it's a Promethean transformation of the external world, and, and the good of animal laws. Okay, so that's the old, that's Marx's view about the human good. No one today, I think, on the left accepts that as a plausible account of the human good. Uh, no one thinks that the, the, the human good involves this uh, transcending nature and transforming the external world. Not, not because it's, it, it kind of stigmatizes animals and puts them in a second-class status. The, the problem for the left is that Marx's view creates all sorts of invidious hierarchies amongst humans. Because that account of the value of a good life, of, of what makes a human life valuable, uh, is more accessible to some people than to others. So, so we've had long waves of feminist critiques of Marx. Because on Marx's view, and this comes out in several of his passages, it, when you know male productive labor, that fits the image of this Promethean transformation of the external world. Whereas women's reproductive labor it just seems like it's kind of merely animal uh, biological functioning. 
And so I mean, there, there are certainly strands of, of, uh, of sexism in, in Marx's writings, and uh, many feminists have said that it's built into this, this Promethean picture of the human good. It's obviously clearly ableist. I mean, it, 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 it privileges able-bodied, mentally and physically able-bodied uh, over, over disabilities. It's also essentially racist, or if you're not that racist, it's colonialist, it's imperialist. So part of the justification for European, you know, when European settlers went out to to the rest of the world uh, and they encountered indigenous peoples engaged in subsistence uh, uh, lifestyles, the Europeans said, uh, you know, they're not transforming the external world. They, they're just they're living lightly on the land. They're, they're barely touching it. They're just they're just uh, and gathering what they need. Whereas the Europeans, with their settled agriculture, they're, they're cutting down all the trees, they're planting huge fields. That's Promethean uh, creative power. And so the Europeans justified the colonization of indigenous peoples precisely on the grounds that, that this, was, uh, this was a higher stage of civilization. And, uh, and Marx basically supported that. I mean, he was a critic at the margins of colonialism, but he said <coughs> the Europeans had a kind of right of historical progress, that this was... When, when Europeans displaced indigenous peoples, this was an expansion of this Promethean power of, of transforming the external world. Okay, so, so we have had waves on the left of feminist critiques, disability critiques, post-colonial critiques of that old Marxist view that the human good rests in this Promethean transformation of the external world. And so, and so we've rejected that. The left has rejected that. And what has replaced it? Well, there's lots of different... Lots of different uh, stories out there, but I think they all have in common the idea that what's central to the human good is um, that, first of all, we are subjects, so we have a subjective experience of the world, and so our, the good life for us depends in part on people's responsiveness to our subjective good, to our subjective preferences, so good life depends on how people respond to my subjectivity. But we're embodied sub subjects. We're not disembodied. We can't transcend nature or transcend our body. Uh, it's central to contemporary left theory that we are embodied subjects. And that means we are vulnerable. In virtue of being finite, embodied subjects, we are vulnerable to all the frailties and that come with being physical, embodied uh, subjects. And so the good life also requires being protective of our vulnerabilities. So, we, so I, I think this is shared across various strands of left theory today. That the, the good for human beings is a matter of being responsive to people's subjectivity and protective of their, their, their embodied vulnerabilities. Okay, if, if that's the, our account of the good, I say, I think this is now more or less, more or less shared across the left today, all, that just immediately extends to animals, that animals are also embodied subjects. And, and, and so their good, the good of animals, is going to be completely continuous with the good of human beings. Uh, unless, so Marx, Marx's account explains and justifies, if you believed it, a radical discontinuity between the good of humans and the good of animals. But if, if the good of humans is embodied subjectivity, well, animals also are embodied subjects. And there's no, there's no philosophical justification for excluding them from our account of, uh, of that. So if you think about, again, if you think about different versions of this on the left, but think about, say, a feminist ethics of care. If you... If you think about what what is the when so when feminist care theorists talk about the good of caring relationships or about the harms that arise when caring relationships break down, it's immediately clear that those goods are also at stake in our relations with animals, both the goods and the harms. That there's that, that, that again that there are going to be continuities rather than discontinuity between humans and animals, and so too with with uh, you know recent uh, left theorists about global justice regarding capabilities. Again, if you, if, you, if you scratch a bit and ask what's, what's the nature of the good that these capabilities are supposed to enable, what's the harm that comes when these capabilities are denied, they're, they're also at stake in our relationships with animals. So I just find it, I, I find it philosophically inconsistent on this new, you know, given transformations within the left's account of the nature of Good, 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 good individual lives and society, it seems to be inconsistent. It should just naturally extend to, to our relations with animals. But to date, the vast majority of what gets written on the left uh, does not consider animals within the scope of their ethical concern. Uh, as such, so that's one, that's one change that's happened on the left. Uh, another change that um, is important is, this, is our, 
on the left's view about the nature of social change. So whatever, the, whatever else the left is, the left is committed to changing society. So the left always has, implicitly or explicitly, a theory of social change. So, but, it, but it's quite different today than it was back, back uh, with the old left. So again, if you go back to Marx, Marx's view about social change was essentially monocausal. So he thought there was one fundamental driver of history, which was class struggle. And, uh, and so he was aware that there were other dimensions of hierarchy and domination. So he was aware that, that men dominated women, that there was, you know, that there was racial hierarchies. But he thought that gender hierarchies and racial hierarchies were byproducts of class struggle. That's to say he believed that gender inequalities and racial inequalities emerged because they were functional for the reproduction of class inequalities, which is what really drove history. And because he believed that, he argued, and Orthodox Marxists believed this for a long time, that there was no need, there was no point in fighting against gender inequality or racial inequality because they were going to, they were going to stay in place so long as they were functional for capitalism. But if we overthrew capitalism, they would disappear of their own accord because they would no longer be needed. They would no longer be functional for, for the reproduction of class inequality. So they were essentially byproducts, and they, they were not. The, they, they, there was no point focusing on them. We should just focus on the one real cause of social change, which is class struggle. Okay, no one on the left believes that today, right? So we're all aware that there are multiple and irreducible dimensions of inequality in our society. So, so gender inequality predated capitalism. Racial inequalities have existed in different historical domains. Uh, and so we recognize that there are multiple dimensions of inequality, multiple forms of hierarchy, none of which are reducible to each other, none of which are, is merely a byproduct of another. But we know that they're all interconnected. They all feed off of each other and, and, and uh, reinforce each other in various complicated ways. And so, of course, this is the heart of intersectionality, which is the dominant methodology, if you like, uh, of, of understanding oppression and understanding social change on the left today. So, the, the, so the, the idea behind intersectionality is that there are these different uh, dimensions of hierarchy and inequality, but they interact and they feed off of each other. So if, you want, if we want to understand, for example, the nature of, of class inequality in our society, we need to understand that it's linked to racial inequalities, and that part of what's going on with various forms of, of uh, class disadvantage is the way in which it becomes racialized. And so okay, so if that's our account of, of social change, it seems to me, again, it naturally extends, should naturally extend to species. Species is also a dimension of, uh, it's, a, it's its own form, not irreducible form of, of dominance and hierarchy, but which is uh, connected to and feeds off of other forms of hierarchy in our society. And so, for example, so Claire Jean Kim's her, her book that just came out uh, on race and species, she talks about how racial hierarchies and species hierarchies energize each other. So part of what's, so when, 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 one of the ways in which racial hierarchies get reproduced is by drawing on tropes about animality <laughs> and, and vice versa. So this is, which is exactly what intersectionality analysis would predict. These are distinct and irreducible dimensions of hierarchy, but they interact, and if we want to understand any of them, we need to understand the others. And so, if we want to fully understand how racial hierarchy works, we need to understand how it links to class, but also how it links to species. Okay, so, again, that just seems to be a natural, uh, the natural logic of the commitment to intersectionality is to attend to species as one of these dimensions of hierarchy, but I would say 99% of what gets written on the left under the heading of intersectionality is, is completely oblivious to Species. Okay, so that's that's my philosophical puzzle. It seems to me that the theoretical developments within the left about the nature of the human good and about the nature of social change should have pushed the left towards a concern with the animal question, and it's puzzling to me that it, it hasn't. Um, so that's a kind of philosophical puzzle. But for, for tonight's talk, I want to focus on the political problem, which is, I, I think, that the fact that the left has not addressed the animal question is uh, is part of the explanation for why, why animal rights have failed over the last 40 years. I don't, I don't want to exaggerate the extent to which that's the main explanation. I, I mean, obviously the left has weakened over the past 40 years. We're living in a broadly neoliberal era in, in which the, the left is not as powerful a social force as it used to be. And so even if the left had embraced animal rights, we still would not have won uh, 
but but I think part I mean, part of the uh, I, I think we would have had more success if, if the left had embraced animal rights. And in any event, going forward, I see no hope for animal rights movement to have any real success unless and until it is reintegrated into the family of social justice movements and and seen as part of a larger progressive social agenda. So so I think it's a pretty important political task to think about how we can get animal rights out of this status of being an orphan of the left and have it being brought back into the family of social justice movements. So, so we need to figure out why why is it orphaned and what can we do to get bring it back. Okay. So why why has animal rights been orphaned from the left? So I, I think there's a lot of explanations for that. Uh, and maybe in the question period we can um, so I'll, I'll just pick up a few that I think are at stake. So one one part of the explanation, I, I think, is that uh, the government and animal industries uh, have quite successfully tarred animal rights with the, with the label being terrorists. And uh, so many people on the left are frightened of being affiliated with the animal rights movement in any form. So they're fighting to maintain their own legitimacy, they're fighting to have a, a seat at the table of various uh, political processes, and they're worried that they will be delegitimized if they're seen as if, if uh, yeah. So uh, animal rights has, has quite effectively been smeared with this label of, uh, of terrorism, and and uh, so many people on the left just don't. Even if they personally had some sympathy, they just don't want to be officially publicly affiliated with animal rights organizations. Uh, so I think that may be part of it. Uh, probably a much larger part of it is just that most people on the left. Uh, like people on the right or people on the center, enjoy the flow of pleasures from exploiting animals. I, so I think you know, that's probably the biggest part of the explanation. Is just they like their leather, they like their, their, their silk, and they like their bacon and eggs, and they're just not uh, particularly interested in giving up on that. And so uh, even if their philosophical commitments should have led them to consume for animals, they're just uh, they're, they're attached to their, their flow of pleasures. But, but so, I, so that, I think both of those are, are, are relevant factors. But the one I want to focus on is, is a third factor, and I'm not sure how important it is, but it's the one that I find most uh, interesting, which is the possibility that many people on the left um, who might be willing to give up their flow of pleasures and who might be even willing to, to, to accept the risk of being tarred as a terrorist, but they worry that the animal that embracing animal rights would come at the expense of other social justice movements. So I think some people have a good faith, some people on the left have a good faith, sincere concern that there is some kind of trade-off between support for animal rights and support for other disadvantaged uh, human uh, subaltern groups. So uh, and that and that uh, yeah. And, and so that there's a kind of dilemma, that there's a moral dilemma, that, that if, if uh, support for animal rights would mean somehow, uh, would, if that would somehow create a barrier to, or delay, or create obstacles for the pursuit of other social justice uh, goals. So why, why might commitment to animal rights impede the pursuit of other social justice goals? I think that's a really important question to figure out because I, I think many people on the left do believe that, and so we've got to figure out why do people on the left believe that, and um, what if anything can we do to overcome that perception? Okay, so let me mention two possible two possible scenarios why some people might, in good faith, believe that embracing animal rights would uh, undermine other social justice goals. So one is the problem about dehumanization. So, one of, uh, one of the most important features of um, hierarchy amongst humans uh, is, is this process of dehumanization. So, de um, so, sub so out groups, excluded groups, marginalized groups, subaltern groups uh, are typically subject to processes of dehumanization. So, this, this is a technical term used in social psychology, it doesn't mean that members of those groups are literally seen as not belonging to the human right race. So it's not about denying that they belong to homo sapiens. The term dehumanization refers to a specific 
phenomenon, which is denying to the members of a particular group that they have what is that they possess what is seen as uniquely human characteristics qualities, those that distinguishes us from the merely animal. And so, what are those uniquely human characteristics? They're things like intelligence. So, to be de dehumanized is to be seen as stupid or dumb. Uh, it involves uh, the ability for self-restraint. So animals are seen as impulsive, whereas humans are seen as having unique capacities for, for self-restraint and self-control. And uh, it involves capacities for kind of refined moral sensibility. So animals are seen as uh, brutish, cruel, uh, whereas humans have this, this uh, capacity for uh, find moral sensibilities and civility. Okay, so, so dehumanization means that the members of these outgroups, yes, of course, they're members of the homo sapiens species, but they're seen as falling short with respect to these uniquely human qualities of intelligence, self-restraint, and uh, moral sensibility. And so that helps explain why they're discriminated against. Is that, and, and I mean, there's overwhelming evidence that this is this isn't just a fancy theory. There's overwhelming sociological evidence that these processes of dehumanization occur with respect to outgroups uh, in Canada, racialized minorities, Aboriginal groups, um, and it and it's, it doesn't just justify uh, it doesn't just lead to discrimination and prejudice. It also leads to harsh treatment of them because it's it's part of the very nature of dehumanization, that uh, it, it, it creates the presumption that you can't deal reasonably with these people because they're seen as impulsive, uh, they're seen as lacking self-restraint, they're seen as cruel or, or, or brutish, and so, so we don't even need to try to reason with them or to engage in, in a voluntary and cooperative. We, we need to act uh, forcefully against them. And so and so one of the consequences of viewing a subgroup as brutish is it justifies treating them brutally, which is exactly what we've been seeing you know, with the police shooting of young black men in the US, that that's, this is an exact manifestation of that, of that phenomenon. The, the police officers assume that, that uh, have a very dehumanized view of young black men, and so, so they don't try to reason with them or talk, talk civilly with them, they just act uh, forcefully, coercively against them. Okay, so, so these, these processes of dehumanization are extremely toxic. Huh? And so one of the central challenges for the left, for the broad left, is to fight processes of dehumanization. <clears throat> so I, I take that, I mean, I, I totally accept that this is a fundamental challenge, a fundamental task. Uh, it's a whole historic task of the left is to fight processes of dehumanization, which are really toxic for society. So the question is, how do you fight dehumanization? So I think that the left has made the, the bet, has made a prediction that the best way to fight dehumanization of outgroups is to uh, exaggerate species difference between humans and other animals. To emphasize that humans are qualitatively different from and superior to animals, other animals, and indeed to sanctify the human. To treat the human as sacred, uh, as, and so radically discontinuous with, with the good of animals, um, on the assumption that if we sanctify the human, that'll make it clear what, that it's so outrageous to be treating these outgroups in, in these dehumanized ways. So, if this is, so the strategy is that if we sanctify the human, this will, this will be a, a resource, this will be an asset that, that outgroups can use to challenge their dehumanized treatment. It, it's a way, it, so give them the tool, give them a resource that they can say, look, it's outrageous that you're, I'm a human being, humans are sacred, it's outrageous that you're treating me like an animal. Okay? So this is, I'm sure you're all familiar with this. Right. Okay. So I understand that. I, so, so, so I can imagine someone on the left saying, yeah, maybe philosophically it's hard to justify this radical discontinuity. You know, maybe it's hard to philosophically justify sanctifying the human and treating animals as, as an entirely different moral category. But politically, it's effective because it gives subaltern groups a tool to challenge dehumanization, which is toxic. Right? 
right? I, I, I understand that as a thought process. Okay, but the claim that uh, creating sh sharp steep species hierarchies reduce, reduces dehumanization is an empirical claim, and it's testable, and it has been tested, and it's just not true. So this is now, there's a, there's a big field of study in social psychology that studies dehumanization, and I think there's overwhelming evidence that those people who draw sharper species distinction between humans, humans and the rest are more likely, not less likely, to dehumanize subaltern groups. This has been shown in many, many different studies, in many different contexts. Those who draw the sharpest species distinction between humans and other animals are more likely to engage in dehumanization of other groups. And not only is this a statistical correlation, although it's, very, it's, it's a very well supported, Correlation, we can, we can, we can uh, establish it causally, experimentally. So they've done these studies in which they, they divide up large groups of people randomly into two groups. And one group, uh, they, and they're both given a short news story. And so one group, so people on this side of the room, get a story uh, uh, describing recent uh, uh, findings in cognitive ethology uh, and in, in social psychology, which show the continuities between humans and animals. So we're not as, as you know, rational, we're, uh, uh, we're not these kind of Kantian rational uh, beings that, that, that we thought, and animals aren't just automatons. That, so the, the newspaper article that they're given emphasizes the continuities between humans and animals. The other side gets a, a new story that talks about the unique, the unique and superior uh, capacities of humans. And so it presents a start, a, 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 stark and steep species hierarchy. And then they're given a questionnaire and asked their opinions about immigrants, about Aboriginal peoples, uh, about people on welfare, and so on. And the people who got the article with the steep species hierarchy uh, expressed much more hostile attitudes towards subaltern groups than those who got the article reporting continuities. So this is, as I say, this is extremely well-established finding. It's just a bad strategy. Sanctifying the human is a bad strategy for fighting dehumanization. So I think that we, ought, that we in the animal rights movement, we can, we can address this concern. I tell you, totally, I mean, so just to repeat, it's a fundamental task for the left to deal with this problem with dehumanization. It's a very toxic problem in our society. But I think we can make a compelling case that animal rights is not going to worsen that problem. On the contrary, it can be part of the solution to that problem. Okay, so that's... That's one, I think, legitimate good faith concern, but I think, I think we can respond to it. A second concern, which is a little harder to deal with, is a concern about cultural bias. So the idea here is that, okay, so animal rights activists want to improve the, the status of animals, and that's, uh, that may be honorable and reasonable uh, on the surface, but we know that we live in a society which is strongly racialized, various racial, ethnic, religious uh, hierarchies. And so we need to, we need to expect, we, we need to predict uh, that if we um, mobilize around animal rights, if we, if we raise animal rights as a politically salient issue, given that we live in a racist society, we can expect that those animal rights principles are going to be applied selectively. So that powerful groups are going to find a way to shield themselves and their practices, their animal practices, are somehow going to be immunized and shielded from criticism and scrutiny, and all the attention is instead going to be focused on, uh, on subaltern groups whose animal practices are going to be scrutinized, put under the microscope. That's because that's just the kind of society we live in. We are, that, that our principles get applied selectively uh, in ways that track power hierarchies. And, and, and so we know this is historically, uh, I mean, that we have lots of examples of this historically. Um, so again, thinking back to kind of European colonizers, um, you know, people have, have gone back and dug out quotes from the, from the reports and diaries and letters of, of these European colonizers who, who expressed shock at the barbaric treatment uh, of animals. By, by indigenous peoples or natives in, in Asia or Africa. Many of these, you know, I mean, it's so strange because many of these European colonists 
you know, they engaged in fox hunts back in England, which they viewed as civilized, right? And they viewed, and they viewed that if, if a particular culture sacrificed an animal for religious purposes, that was viewed as barbaric. Whereas fox hunts were, I mean, it's hard to know what, but 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 that's but that's what we should expect that people will apply these norms selectively in ways that track existing power hierarchies. And so, and, and, and this isn't just a historic phenomenon, we can see it even today, that, that if you, a, a disproportionate amount of media attention on animal issues focuses on minority animal practices. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, in Europe today, you know, the big issue around animal welfare is halal slaughter, right? Muslim ritual slaughter. So, uh, you know, this is a tiny percentage of the, of the animal exploitation and animal harm that occurs in Europe, but but that's what gets the media attention. Uh, or, or you could think about um, the, the media attention on um, the indigenous whale hunt in, in the American uh, Northwest, or, or the, the indigenous seal hunt here in Canada, or, or think about the shark fin soup issue here in Toronto. So these are all, I mean, even all taken together, these are just a tiny, tiny fraction of the, of the harm that we impose on animals, most of which is done by the majority groups through institutional, you know, through, through factory farming and through research labs and so on. But, folk, but attention gets focused on disadvantaged groups. And, and so that, that's, that's a kind of predictable uh, effect of, of, uh, of the kind of society we live in. And it, and it operates to further exoticize and stigmatize already disadvantaged minorities. And so the animal issue becomes yet another way in which uh, exist, uh, disadvantaged groups become further alienated or, or distanced. Um, and, and of course, this is sometimes quite deliberate, actually. So yeah, going back to the case of ritual slaughter, we've got all these far-right anti-immigrant parties in, in Western Europe Who've, who've never before expressed any interest whatsoever in the animal question, uh, have all of a sudden become champions of animal welfare solely for the purpose of uh, making life uh, miserable for Muslims. Mm -hmm. so, so, so they don't care, they don't care at all about animals. But what they want to do is they want to make life miserable for Muslims. They want to encourage Muslims to go back home, as they see it. And so they want to make life miserable for them, so they're, so they're going to... They've, they've focused on ritual slaughter as, a, as it's just a stick to beat Muslims with. It's purely instrumental. But again, we, should, we, should, we on the left should expect this kind of instrumentalization of, uh, <coughs> of uh, principles to... to uh... Okay, so that's what I mean by cultural bias. To, given the kind of society we live in, we, we need to expect that... Uh, these, these principles, these values around animals are going to be applied selectively in, in ways that, uh, that are harmful to already disadvantaged groups. Okay, so I think that's a very serious concern. And so then the question is, what do we do about it? And uh, what do we do about the fact that there's a risk that if we push the animal question onto the public agenda, it's going to be applied in selective ways and in sometimes instrumental ways instrumentalized ways against uh, disadvantaged groups. So, so the, obviously, the, 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 some people on the left, their response is, well, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't politicize the animal question. We shouldn't, we shouldn't make it salient, because we, we're, we're, we, there's this risk of, uh, uh, of it being used in these selective and instrumentalized ways. So, so, we, just, so we, should, we just shouldn't talk about it. Um, Okay, and I, again, I, I kind of understand that, but it's worth noting that that same anxiety about selectivity and, and uh, instrumentalization also arises for other parts of the left's agenda. <laughs> so think about gender equality, uh, that that too can be used in ways uh, that um, selectively target uh, disadvantaged groups and, and instrumentalized, and in fact, it, it's a perfect, it's a perfect, perfect analogy. It's this, if you look at these far right anti immigrant parties in Europe, they're doing the same thing with gender equality. They have never cared about gender equality before, but all of a sudden they've become champions about gender equality. Again, as a way of saying to Muslims, you and your Sharia, you don't belong here, 
and so so the, the, so these these, these far which are the culturally conservative groups they're really they're really not interested in gender equality for its own sake. What but but they're just instrumentalizing it as a way to uh, uh, annoy Muslims. So but in that case the left's response. So we know this is a risk that if we if we if we if we highlight gender equality as one of our fundamental goals on the left, we know that it's likely going to be used in some cases quite instrumentally and deliberately to to target. Uh, disadvantaged groups, but on that issue, the left the left doesn't say, okay, so we better we better back off gender equality. Uh, what instead the left says is, no, we're committed to gender equality. It's a fundamental principle of the left, but we need to be conscious of the ways that it can be used and misused and instrumentalized. Which means we need to think carefully about how we promote gender equality. Namely, we want to make sure we do it in cooperation and consultation with members of the, the disadvantaged group. We want, to, we want to pursue that issue in context that, that will put the majority under scrutiny as well as the minority. So, so we build in safeguards to avoid selectivity, to avoid the perception that you know, the whites are telling the, the non-whites what, what civilization means and so on. So, so this is, these are standard, I mean, you all know this, these are standard the standard issues that, that have developed within multicultural feminism or post-colonial feminism, we, we actually have now many years of experience of working through how do you promote a value like gender equality, knowing that it's, we're living in these racialized contexts where these, these values can be deployed selectively and instrumentally. How, how, what's, a, what's an ethically responsible way of promoting gender equality? That's, we've, we've done a lot of work, we've done a lot of thinking about that on the left, and it seems to me all the things we've learned with respect to, say, post-colonial feminism, we could also apply to the animal rights issue. We could also think about ways of, of promoting animal rights in a way that's ethically responsible, that's done in consultation with coordination with minority groups, and that, and that uh, puts um, majority and minority practices equally under the microscope rather than just singling out minorities. So, I, so it seems to me that there is that the left has the resources if, if it cared if it cared about animals that that. Uh, we have the we have the, the lessons we've already learned many of the lessons we need about how how to promote that value in a in an ethically responsible way. In any event, I, I, I think that if we care about this issue of a cultural bias, I think that the worst possible situation is the status quo. I think I think it's the status quo that invites uh, cultural bias on the animal question. Actually, I think I think cultural bias is built into the existing legal framework in, in, in a very pernicious way. And so if you're on the left and you care about cultural bias, you should very much be unhappy with the status quo. So the status quo, as you all know, says that humans have the right to harm animals for our benefit, but so long as it doesn't involve unnecessary suffering or cruelty, right? So we have the, we have we give ourselves the right to harm animals for our benefit, but no unnecessary suffering, no cruelty. What does it mean? No unnecessary suffering. So the law doesn't define that term, uh, and you, if you think about it, it's a kind of strange uh, term because, after all, virtually all of the suffering we impose on animals is unnecessary, strictly speaking. So people don't need to eat meat; we can be vegan. So all of all of the suffering we impose on animals in in uh, factory farming is unnecessary, right? But when the courts say that um, we we, we uh, that we shouldn't have unnecessary suffering, they were clearly not intending to forbid people eating meat. So what So what then does unnecessary suffering mean? Uh, I mean, so the law is clearly, the intention was that the majority can continue to have its flow of pleasures from harming animals. The law wasn't intending to stop that. Um, and in order to protect the right of the majority to maintain its flow of pleasures, from the harming of animals, uh, it is part of the jurisprudence of animal anti-cruelty law that generally accepted practices are exempt from anti-cruelty provisions. So th this is, believe it or not, this is part of the law. Generally accepted practices are exempt, are by definition. So again, just think about this for a second. Generally accepted practices are by definition not cruel. That's what the law says. Right? Okay. So, so the, the status quo uh, um, immunizes majority practices. 
Majority practices are by definition generally accepted practices, and they are by definition immunized from anti-cruelty provisions. So the status quo gives a clean pass to majority practices. It, it can only work against minority practices, which are not generally accepted. And so if, uh, if a particular immigrant group eats a dog, that's unnecessary suffering, that's cruelty. If the majority eats a pig, that's, that's, not, that's not unnecessary suffering, that's not cruel. That, this is just an expression of cultural bias. This is just one culture eats this animal, the other culture eats the other animal. And, and the, the status quo authorizes, legitimizes cultural bias. That, that, so I, I think that even, even, since, even if you didn't care about animals, even if all you cared about was this risk of cultural bias in the application of the animal question, the status quo is the worst possible outcome. So, and I think if, we're, if what we want is a more even-handed outcome, if we want to put both majority and minority practices if we, want to, if we want to hold both the majority and the minority accountable for their treatment of animals, we need to get away from this existing status quo, which immunizes majority practices, and instead subject both to some fundamental principles of animal rights. And so I think that an animal rights agenda would radically diminish the space for these culturally biased uh, and, select, and selective occupations of animals. Uh, the animal question. Okay, so so uh, again, I, I, I think there is a kind of good faith concern on the part of some people on the left that if we raise the animal question, it will lead to, to these culturally biased uh, outcomes that, that further stigmatize disadvantaged groups. And I understand that. It's an important concern, but I think that, that there's a response to it and that animal rights uh, actually is part, is part of the remedy. It's part of the solution, rather than part of the problem. Okay, so that's basically... Um, my, th th those are my responses to what I take to be possible good faith concerns on the left about the animal question. I want to repeat that I think the real, at the end of the day, I think the real explanation for the left, why the left doesn't care about animals is because they want their flow of pleasures. But, and I think that's, you know, 90% of the explanation. But insofar as there are good, I think there are, for some people on the left, good faith concerns that there might be a trade-off between animal rights and other social justice movements. And I've tried to identify two. But, but I think you can respond to them. And if, if, those are, if my arguments are sound, then I think uh, we, we, can, we can make the case to reintegrate animal rights into the family of social justice movements, which I think we need to do if we're ever going to have uh, an effective movement. Uh, so, so, so far, I, I, I've been focusing on why I think the left needs to rethink its approach to animal rights. But in conclusion, let me just quickly say, of course, this needs to be a two-way street. And so we should also think about what the animal rights movement needs to do in order to um, be a member in good standing of the family of social justice movements. Uh, I mean, the, the, the animal rights movement has been, has been um, pushed out uh, for so long that we've started, I think, to act like an orphan. And we've, we've kind of locked to some extent, lost the habit of acting like a member of the larger family of social justice movements. I think we kind of need to relearn some of the habits of being a good member of a, of a larger family of social justice movements. So let me just mention some of the things that I think we need to do in order to make this, this reintegration possible or, or more feasible. So I think, I think there need to be changes at the level both of the strategies that we use for pursuing our animal rights goals and also more interestingly, perhaps, some changes in the goals themselves. So just very quickly, on, on, the, on the strategic question, um, if, we're going to be, if animal rights is going to be a member in good standing of the family of social justice movements, we need to think about how our tactics, how our campaigns um, affect other social justice campaigns. And we need to think about that deliberately uh, and carefully and consciously. And so, for example, if we want to be if we want to be seen as allies of the feminist movement, we should not be using sexist tactics in animal abuse. So, uh, there's a very you know this this is a long-standing debate about whether PETA uses sexist tactics. I, I just I just say that that's that's exactly the kind of right. I mean. Uh, if we want to be a member in good standing of the family of social justice movements, we clearly need to be very careful to make sure we're not using sexist or uh, I, I think there are also concerns about the way in which we use disability. I, I, this is a long story. I, I won't be able to 
the, the issues of disability pop up in the animal rights literature, but if you look at the way it pops up, it's almost always in a very instrumental way. That is, people look, point to disability in order to bolster the case for animal rights. It's never an expression of concern for disability. It's never, it expresses an interest in the nature of their claims uh, or, or even solidarity with their struggles. It's just, it's just to bolster the case. It's just to score points. Uh, and, 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 one, and unfortunately, one of the ways in which some people on the animal rights movement try to score points for animal rights is by actually, you know, kind of diminishing, is to emphasize, to emphasize how diminished certain kinds of cognitive disability are uh, in comparison with the, the capacities of some animals. And so it actually works to reproduce uh, various kinds of uh, um, prejudices against, against disability. Uh, so that that we need to reboot that conversation about animal rights and disability, um, and and I also think on, on on the issue about about uh, race and religion and so on. I, I, I think by I, I think by and large animal rights groups don't engage, don't they certainly don't deliberately in, um, criticize. Uh, they don't engage in, in forms of discourse that that. Um, uh, Find minority groups as backward or uncivilized, um, but I'll, but I think I think minority groups do need to be very careful about the way in which their advocacy can be used or misused uh, by other groups like these far right groups. And just, what what are the ways of safeguarding against it? Okay, so those are all, if you like, just at the level of strategy and tactics. Just thinking consciously about the ways in which the way we present our arguments and and, and the tactics uh, can can have often unintended but but negative effects on other social justice movements. Uh, the, the, but uh, at, at, there's a deeper level that I think we may need to rethink our, the very goal, the very way we conceptualize justice for animals. Because I think the way in which the animal rights movement generally has conceptualized justice for animals has made it harder to form links with other social justice movements. So, um, uh, going back to Peter Singer, um, the animal rights movement generally, this is a generalization, has uh, focused almost exclusively, it's, it's described animals in a very minimal way uh, as essentially uh, beings who are capable of suffering, they're sentient so they can feel pain. So what they are is essentially uh, carriers of pain, <laughs> um, and who, who uh, and who are the passive recipients of our harmful practices. So animals appear as passive victims uh, uh, who suffer at human hands, uh, and our duty is to stop causing them suffering. So they are the kind of pa so currently they're the passive victims of human harm, and what an, an animal justice is conceived of as they become the passive recipients of our duty not to harm. Okay, that's a very minimalist conception of justice and of animals. Uh, so animals don't appear as, as agents, they don't, they don't appear as, as willful beings who are, who are trying to, who have the capacity for flourishing and, and complex lives. They, they don't appear as agents who are capable of resisting and negotiating. And, they're just these passive uh, carriers of, of passive receptacles of pain. Right? Um, okay, uh, so that that creates this radical discontinuity between animal justice and human justice. Because in no case of human justice do we think that all that's required for justice is to stop harming others. Right? Uh, in the case of humans, we, we think of justice as being this kind of rich. Uh, uh, it's a rich concept, which involves. Uh, trying to create relations uh, which are responsive to the good of another and which create the conditions under which others are able to pursue their flourishing. Right? That's, what we, that's what we want justice for in the human case, is to create uh, uh, you know, good relationships and create the social conditions that enable flourishing. That's what justice is about in the human case. But in the case of animals, it's just, it's just about not harming these passive victims. And so people in other social justice movements can't see any connection 
between human justice and animal justice. And so, I, you know, I said earlier that, that on, the, on, the, on the accounts of the left, the new accounts of the left, the human good should be seen as continuous with the animal's good. Well, I think that the, the, the human justice should be seen as continuous with animal justice. Um, and so we need a much richer conception of, our, of what justice is in relation to animals. Um, and this is made even worse by, I think, the, the extinctionist strand in animal rights theory. So one strand of, this is not the only strand, but one strand of animal rights theory says that domesticated animals, that what justice requires for domesticated animals is, is rendering them extinct. Uh, either on the grounds that, that because they've been bred for dependency, they're incapable of a dignified life. They're inherently degraded just by virtue of their genetic makeup. They're now so inherently degraded that they're not capable of leading good lives. Or that because they're so dependent, and because humans have, have such a strong interest in exploiting them, humans can never be trusted to create just relations with domesticated animals. But whichever reason, or some combination of both, the conclusion is justice for domesticated animals involves extinguishing them. Okay, so I think that's this crazy theory of justice, that justice for the victims uh, uh, is extinguishing them. And, 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 and it can only, and it's worth noting, it could only be achieved by further injustices. I mean, how... How are you going to stop them? The only way to stop them from reproducing is either sterilization or forcible confinement, both of which I think are a violation of animal rights, and, and which we would never allow in the, in the human context. So I, it, it's an, I think it, it, it could only, it's an unjust goal that could only be pursued by unjust means. So I think it's philosophically deeply suspect. But for, for today's purposes, the deeper problem is it again creates a radical chasm between animal justice and human justice. In no possible case of human justice would we think that the, out, the desirable outcome is extinction, right? And so, okay, so I, I just think that the way in which animal rights people have themselves articulated the conception of justice towards animals makes it impossible for other social justice movements to see any affinities, to see any resonances. So I think we need to start over and instead think about animal justice, our, right, our just relations with animals are, should be seen as essentially continuous with relations of justice amongst humans, which is to say that, as in the human case, justice is about being responsive to the subjective good of animals and about trying to create relations that are as responsive to their good as to ours, and that involves creating various kinds of political and legal statuses that would be responsive to their good as well as to ours. Okay, so in Zoo, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to stop in two seconds. That in, so in Zoo, Sue and I propose, as a way of trying to make sense of this, that we might think of domesticated animals as members of our society, and in, in that sense, having membership rights, and in that sense, as our co-citizens, because citizenship just is, about membership. Um, so we should think about, about domesticated member, uh, animals as, as our co-citizens, and we should try to create mechanisms that would ensure that our shared life together as domesticated animals are responsive to their good as well as to ours. We should view our relationship with wild animals on the model of relations amongst sovereign uh, people, so we should think of them as having their own rights to sovereignty. I won't go into the details, but the point is that these are, are, are highlighting, it's not treating animals as passive victims, and, and, and the justice involves, simply involves not harming them. It instead envisions justice as creating <coughs> relations between us and animals that, uh, um, that uh, so we start from the premise that the goal is to create just relations, and the, the, the meaning of justice is going to, the, the nature of those relations is going to vary depending on the, 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 the domesticated animals, it's going to be a different story than wild animals. But in both cases, the goal is to try to create legal and political structures that would ensure that that relationship evolves in ways that is responsive to their good as ours. And if, if people find that, if that, part of the reason we developed that theory, this political theory of animal rights, I think it's, it gives us a better, I think it gives us a better philosophical account of what justice requires, but I also think it creates the possibility of forming resonances with other social justice movements. I, I think there are similar issues about membership, about participation, about voice, about agency, about inclusion, uh, that, that, that we can learn across, uh, across the species lines. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Well, we should we should just go right into the the discussion. Hey? Great. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, so, regarding the tension between different social justice movements and maybe why animal rights is on the outside, 
and here's a view that I came up with as we were talking, so it's not very well thought out. But I mean, one possibility is that rather than just flows of pleasure as being an explanation, there's also um, the, a flow of culture. And so I'll worry with, you might say, there's a tension between animal rights and different social justice movements because, because, uh, because animal rights issues will permeate so much of the other um, the other justice movements that, whereas you know, Aboriginal rights and feminism might not conflict that much. Um, Aboriginal rights and animal rights, um, at least superficially, do conflict because you know, for reasons of seal hunting, whale hunting, and that sort of thing, um, and maybe just other um, other cultural preservation types of things. You know, the, the way that we look at food is a huge element for our uh, part of our. Um, and so I'm wondering if there's kind of a specific, you know, that's a, a specific feature of animal rights that the other social justice movements don't really have uh, in them, and, and how that might affect the story. Yeah. So, but again, I, I'm um, I'm trying to in this talk um, to to figure out um, what's going on in the left. Specifically, uh, rather than um, uh, what's going on in the average member of the, of the general public, and, and so what um, I take it to be one of the distinguishing features of the left that um, they that uh, they we myself talking about one. Are um, that, that uh, are conscious of the ways in which um, cultural tradition is never, um, you know, neutral or or even benign. It's always it's always contested. It's always the outcome of of power relations. And it always encapsulates all kinds of um, uh, exclusions, um, and uh, so so I, I don't I don't you know I don't think of the left as being kind of uh, they're not traditionalists. Whatever the left is, they're not traditionalists. I, I just think that's axiomatic. Um, and so uh, and and so it's part of I think to be one of the kind of uh, premises of the left that cultural traditions are not self-justifying, that they think that part of, what, part of what it is, part of who we are as a left is we want to hold cultural traditions up to the, up to the light and, and, uh, and expose the power dynamics that are, that are often hidden in them um, and, and to expose the extent to which what it's claimed to be a common property of all is in fact, you know, was authored by some at the expense of others. Um, and so, I and and I take to be one of the. I mean, this may be this may be overstating it, but that um, you know, you sort of um, one one mark. <laughs> no, this is this is overstating it. But kind of one one marker of you know, one's one's the sincerity of one's commitment to the left is is um, that. Uh, um, the, the the more critical one is uh, about uncovering these these um, uh, these forms of, of uh, power and exclusion in the, within cultural traditions, and so I you know the, 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 if we set aside the animal question and just ask more generally, does the left shy away from issues? That involve dramatic cultural transformation. I would say no. That's that's what that's what we're that's what we're all about. That's what the left is about: radical cultural transformation. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I think it's a completely different story with the larger general public. There, I think you know, um, culture, the, the forms of cultural resistance. That that's what it's generally what I find puzzling. I, I, I um, so I, th I think there's people on the left as. Um, as not being by instinct inclined to just defer to cultural authorities and cultural traditions. That's the way we've always 
done things. Always. Yeah, the, the, um, and it, that, but that, that critical edge just seems to be kind of lost on him. <clears throat> Hi, thank you. First thing I was looking for you in the other building, and consequently I'm late and I interrupt you. I apologize. Good to be here. Uh, I agree with several, very much with several points. I, I have never read your work uh, on writings, and I agree highly that uh, dehumanization and cultural bias are great uh, uh, reason, reasoning for you know, the attitude we hold. I think it's also possible, though, that a lot of the public feel guilty. They feel guilty, by and large, that they don't, say, extend out their uh, goodwill, donate, or be selfless and participate in charitable activities for any group across the board type thing. Consequently, if they were to, you know, uh, do so towards the animal rights group, that would sort of really go over or spill over maybe into the dehumanization element too. Maybe they do nothing at home. I know some families that don't give anything to charity. They never have enough money for their children's whatever, hockey equipment, whatever, whatever. There's nothing really selfless about them. And uh, God forbid, if they're going to, you know, demonstrate any kindness or display anything, any charity towards animals, sort of thing. So, food for thought there, too. I think they just need a, a good lesson in ethics, because we, we will have a very difficult time changing that strata, more than maybe the general or status quo. Um, another thing, uh, you know, it, it seems to be, I mean, I've never... I joined a lot of people in activities that are, you know, exclusively vegan and that. And I'll tell you this much: they, they, uh, I just started to feel an, uh, a feel that this is an ostracizing uh, endeavor in a manner. A lot of public hold like vegans totally outside of, you know, uh, normative. Uh, Positions as such, and in in effect, you know, they um, they do ostracize themselves. And the term, in and of itself, vegan, you know, gives rise to a lot of restrictions and a great life changing um, discipline. And it's difficult. Nobody really wants to go there. And I uh, I know some people that are say they want some say they want to do activities but abstain and refrain from using the word vegan instead maybe plant based something a little more liberal and kinder uh, so i think that's really important a consideration in moving forward and getting the message out there you know i've worked in marketing a lot on telephones for companies and everything i've always worked at the bottom rung and been the backbone of a lot of people communicating and so on, and I'll tell you what, one thing they always teach you, you know, in marketing, listen, you know, you don't know what, if you're marketing a product or service or whatever, these people don't know they need what you're going to tell them in half a minute down the road, right? They would never have thought about the fact they were without for so long, and it's the same thing with this movement, too. The public have their head in the sand. You need to, this message about animal welfare and the relationships with the environment and everything has to really go out there in a very progressive way. And it's not an issue, you know, kindness or the state of how it goes out is not really important. What is important, the state of the earth is not going to be as it is today in 50 years, so person's great-grandchildren are not going to have be reaping a lot of natural resources that we take for granted. Now, isn't that a good enough argument? Okay, so that's all I want to say, really. Thank you very much. Uh, just, just a, I mean, there's a lot there, but just a quick comment about, uh, oh, yeah. um, about I, 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 I hesitate to wade into the, the veganism as a moral baseline question. So, but um, th this is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's probably a different debate and uh, for a different time, but let, let me just, um, uh, I, 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 so I think that, that at the end of the day, um, uh, ju if, if you know, justice for animals um, requires um, that we renounce 
um, the right to, to eat animals and animal products. So I, 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 I have. So I think that is part of the. That's certainly part of my conception of, of uh, what we're aiming to. But um, I, I think there is a um, there's a worry. There's a tr there's a worrisome trend. I think in some parts of the animal rights movement to take. Uh, veganism as the moral baseline for whether you're even acknowledged to be a legitimate member of the movement. And um, I mean, there's a lot of problems with that. One is, I mean, it's, it's created this odd situation that, um, so we, we impose, you know, so many different kinds of harms on animals. Um, uh, and uh, and and in many people, so you, you can have a situation in which someone is, I don't know, uh, an engineer for uh, uh, an oil sands company, and their work, or or they're a stockbroker dealing with energy companies, let's say, and and so they are a central part of a machinery which is devastating the planet and is causing lethal harm to lots and lots of animals. Um, but if that person is a vegan, then they're in, and anyone who's fighting uh, to protect uh, wildlife uh, is out if they if they deviate an inch from from someone else's conception of what, what a vegan diet is. And so I, I think that what so one problem is that I I think we need to recognize the full set of harms and injustices that we impose on animals. And that we should, uh, anyone who's working to, to, to stop those injustices, I think, um, should be, should be uh, supported. And um, it, so there's a, there's a, so, one, so one problem with the, with the veganism as a moral baseline is that it, it actually, I think, operates to render invisible all, all the other ways in which. Uh, be a vegan in your diet and still be causing catastrophic harms to, uh, to animals in one's lifestyle more generally. Um, and so, so we, need, we need a richer conception of, of justice towards animals that... that uh, um, but all, I also think another problem with the, with the, with the focus on veganism as a moral baseline is that, is that um, it's... Uh, I, I just think it's, it's at odds with what we know about human psychology. So... Um, the kind of change that's required in becoming a vegan, for most people, is difficult and requires support. It's not something they can do on their own. And uh, we, as a movement, we're obsessed with getting them to make the initial conversion from being a meat eater to vegan, and we're terrible at providing the support that enables them to stay vegan. And the result is, I don't know how many of you have seen the, the Humane Research Council report that came out a few months ago, four out of five, uh, so two percent, this is an American study, two percent of Americans are vegetarians, ten percent are former vegetarians. That's a staggering statistic. Right? Four out of five revert to eating meat. And most of them within three months. That's what the study showed. Most of them revert within three months. So it's, it makes no sense for us to be investing all of our energy on getting that initial conversion when we know four out of five are going to revert, and they revert not because they became convinced of ideologies of human supremacism. They, 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 they convert because it's just hard. It, they, they have trouble finding the product, but, but mainly, in most cases, it's social awkwardness. It, yeah. they, they're running into troubles with their friends, with their family. They don't want to feel like they're, that they're always the problem person, or they feel awkward. So, so we, we need to, I mean, the, the, so the idea of veganism is baseline. It's an it's a unhelpfully, indivi kind of atomistically individualistic conception of what it is to be committed to the movement. So, I, I um, yeah, so we need a, a more a more social conception, and, and we need to we need to figure out how to support societies and communities to make these changes rather than just obsessing with individuals, because uh, it's just it's, uh, and, and also we need a much more political conception of of uh, yeah. yeah sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, I mean, help to, um, I mean, for people to look at a book like Mary Mitchley's Beast and Man, where uh, the sort of continuity thesis, and just see how the distinctly human capacities kind of have their precursors and other animals, and maybe get a more of a sense of their agency, their affection for the young, and like, yeah. the whole business. Or is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, so Midgley is one of this is this when in, in the in the when the philosophers in, in the animal rights community get together, this is one of the uh, similar refrains is that um, uh, for a variety of reasons, Peter Singer is kind of uh, in the stratosphere. Uh, many of us find Mary Midgley's work actually much more um, insightful and helpful. Uh, both both philosophically and politically, so it's a, there's a kind of uh, uh, it's, a, it's and there's a, there's an interesting question: Why it is it usually got lost um, and how to, how to resurrect it? So I completely agree. I think your stuff is terrific. Um, so one of the one of the uh, distinctive features of the story Sue and I tell is that we we, it, we really have a two level story. One level is about what what is required for an animal to be uh, to have a claim to basic rights, not to be armed, to be experimented on, to be, to be killed, and so on. And for that, we think sentience is enough. If they have a subjective experience of the world, uh, if they experience that their, their, their life going better or worse, that should be enough. But then they have their own life to lead, and we have no right to use them for our, for our benefit. So that's that's a relatively low threshold sentience. But domesticated animals are social animals. Uh, who have a limbic, you know, for those of you who are into in that kind of evolutionary history, right, they have a limbic brain. So they're, they're, they're social beings, they're emotional beings, all of which uh, um, we share in evolutionary terms. Um, and so the, the continuities, um, and so, so uh, it's a distinctive feature of domesticated animals. Um, so we're a social species, they're a social species, um, but moreover, what's distinctive about domesticated animals is that they're capable of having social relations with us. That is, they're capable of interspecies sociability. Most animals, most wild animals, are not capable of having social relations across species lines. But domesticated animals are. They couldn't have been domesticated unless they were capable of coming to trust humans and to understand human communications and gestures and so on. So, and obviously we're capable of interspecies sociability because that also was Condition of, uh, of domestication. So, so the the there's a there's a much, so it, our we have the possibility of relations with domesticated animals that are far richer. Uh, we we have the capacity for for forms of, of sociability, for trust, for cooperation, um, uh, and, and for various kinds of intimacy and affection and care that that that. Um, don't rest just on the sentience, but rest instead on this, this uh, probably this, this shared evolution of the history in the limbic brain. Yeah. Um, but just to pick up on that, <laughs> just to pick up on that, um, when, I was, when I was hearing you talk about the um, animals as being, what were the words used, that, uh, that we just concerned about their suffering and, and it's a very negative view. Um, there are other people like Jonathan Balcom who've done yeah. work on pleasure, yeah. the pleasure of yeah. animals uh, derived in their own life, let alone their interactions with humans, um, which I think is something that we should certainly promote as a movement. Um, but also I think the farm sanctuaries that are around are allowing people to interact with animals on a, on a very different level, including typically domesticated animals that we eat, or the yeah. majority of society eats, or bears, or etc. Um, or exploits in some other way, uh, and that we have a chance, people have a chance to have an inter, a personal and interpersonal relationship yeah. with animals, uh, well, you know, on a much more you know, close level yeah. uh, than they would ever have, uh, yeah. just having them on their dinner plate or wearing them, etc. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's a very positive trend and something that should be exploited even more and developed even more. I, I agree completely. So, so Sue and I have another paper. Uh, on farm sanctuaries, uh, the subtitle is "The Heart of the Movement." Uh, question mark. Um, <laughs> so, no, but, it's, but we take it. It's, 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 we, we pose it as a question, but we take it seriously as a question because actually, farm sanctuaries are one of the very few places in our society where 
we actually have the space to explore and to experiment with possible just relations with domesticated mm -hmm. animals. And so I actually think they're hugely important. Um, and I think that the, the spread of them is, is an exciting trend and they're, they're radically understudied as a phenomenon and we need, we need to, 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 to learn from them. So, so all that I agree with. My only uh, quibble, and that's the, the, this other paper, is that um, uh, farm sanctuaries at the moment um, I mean, the, 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 the kind of, uh, uh, silly version of our critique is that they haven't yet embraced our theory, so... They're, they're <laughs> the, 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 um, they're largely run, so, they, farm sanctuaries, the, the good ones, I mean, they, they range enormously in quality, but the best ones, like, like farm sanctuary, the, the economist, the first one, um, they provide extremely high level health care, medical care for, for their animals, including to the point uh, of actually creating kind of veterinary breakthroughs. Because many of these animals have never been allowed to live a, a, a normal lifespan, right? And so for, in farm sanctuaries, they're dealing with health problems of geriatric pigs that veterinarians have never seen before. Because the pigs have never been okay, so the, so the, and that's fantastic, and they're, and they're, they're kind of you know breakthroughs uh, in, in 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 the possibilities. Okay, but um, I think I would like farm sanctuaries to be the space, and we explore new forms of community, and including new forms of cooperation, uh, and new forms of of. Uh, of uh, friendships and, and, and okay, so I, I, at, at the moment if you go to an average farm sanctuary, in most cases each species has its own separate field. So they're not actually allowed to socialize as much as I would like across species lines. They're not allowed to form their own friendships as much as I would like. There's, there's reasons for this, including health and safety reasons, but still. They're also not allowed to engage in work. Now this is an interest. so I would love to talk about this at length, but I think this is a very interesting question for the movement. So the farm sanctuary starts from the premise, animals have been exploited, we're not going to we're not going to ask anything from them, we're not going to expect them to contribute. I just completely understand that. But in the human case, work is one of the things that gives life meaning. I think, I think, for, for, and it's, so it's a form of exclusion to, to keep humans out of, the, out of the workplace, right? I, I think many animals, I, I don't want to generalize, but I think many animals also would find it meaningful to cooperate with humans for some common purpose. I, I, I firmly believe that, that there are forms of work that are meaningful to animals, and that, that, that it's in line with their interests and inclinations, and that they would get a sense of belonging and satisfaction from contributing, just as humans do. Um, and so, and I think we need to figure out, I think it would be extremely useful if one of the things we can do on farm sanctuaries is to figure out what kinds of work do animals like to do. That would be very interesting. Uh, and, and farm sanctuaries could be a place to do that. But they have made an ideological commitment that they're never going to act, they're never going to provide the opportunity for animals to explore farms of work. And I think that, so, so uh, this is a, a longer paper. So, 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 so what you're saying in a way is that the farm sanctuaries are, are almost petting zoos. Well, <laughs> no, so, no, I, yeah, so, the, 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 um, uh, this is a sense of, so, I, it's hard to know how, it's hard to even know how to even talk about this issue because I, the people who set up farm sanctuaries are, they're heroic, they've de dedicated their lives, uh, uh, and, and also all of their financial resources, they've gone to huge debt in order to get, um, and uh, they fought, they've had to fight every step of the way with local planning boards and, and, and with far farming neighbors and, um, uh, and, and as I said, and, and against hostile vets and, and public health officials. I mean, so, so they, they, you know, I, I have nothing but praise and admiration for the people who set up farm sanctuaries, the good ones. Uh, I do think that there's a serious risk that many of the people who go to them experience them as petting zoos. That I think is a serious risk. And I, I, I don't think, and I know that they're aware of that, of course. And so they think that they have a pedagogy 
You know, so a guide, the company is your round, and the guide is supposed to be providing you information in a way that creates cognitive dissonance and that gets you out of just the petting zoo mentality. The, 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 we have no good empirical evidence about what is the actual impact on visitors of going to a farm sanctuary. The farm sanctuary was about to commission a big empirical stu study that would actually try to scientifically test this, and they decided not to. Um, it's, so it's a bit like zoos. So I, I mean, so here's an interesting analogy. Those of us, I think, most most people in the animal rights movement, uh, so zoos are not really terrible, and for lots of reasons, but but including, I think, the idea that they have an educational value is I just think bogus. I, I, there's no evidence that people come out of zoos with enhanced respect for animals. I think, on the contrary, there's some evidence that they come out with a diminished view of animals. Um, Okay, and, and so when zoos claim that they're providing this great public service, I say, show me the evidence, because I just don't believe it. So, I, I, I'm, I, so when it comes to farm sanctuaries, you know, I, 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 I too, I, I, they, they, from speaking to some, some of the, the people who run them, they, they, they think that they have effectively dealt with the, the, the potential that people experience it as a petting zoo. I would like to see some evidence, because I, I may still be experience that way. Thanks. That actually wasn't my question. I wanted to ask about, about media coverage, because so much of what we learn about the conditions of the harm done to animals are through mainstream media, and it's and maybe you, you would want to argue that corporate media is inherently right-wing, uh, but there, I mean, when you look at a, a, a newspaper like the Toronto Star, which claims to be left-wing with its Atkinson principles and so on, I just wanted to take the, the example of the Slaughterhouse 7, which, which was covered widely in, in, in the newspapers. And, and many people notice the consistent. Pardon me? It wasn't. Well, no, that's well, what I meant to say is that it, that it was ignored by, right. by, by the so called left wing uh, papers, I mean the Trump Star, whereas the right wing, uh, the Trump Sun, gave it a fair amount of coverage. Would you say with, te with you know, the uh, interviews? Oh, because they had a shot of someone being violent. The police being violent? Uh, of an activist being violent. Uh huh. That's but, the only reason. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I thought, I don't know, Anita Kreins uh, mentioned that she found that the interviewer with the Trans son uh, was actually more sympathetic, she found, than, than, than almost any other media. Well, they said someone before anything happened, too, so they yeah. at least had someone yeah. on the scene, and, and most other organizations knew. I'm just, wondering, <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering about the left-right dichotomy when yeah. it comes to media coverage. Yeah. What, what you think of that? Yeah, I, I, I don't um, have any... Um, uh, so, um, yeah, I, I mean, basically, I just, I, I don't know, um, whether we have any good kind of over time, uh, studies of, um, I, so I, I certainly would not, um, the, the, I do not, I do not look to, so you mentioned the Toronto Star, I, I, I so I, I look at the Guardian, you know, so the British left wing paper, it's terrible, I'm really terrible in these issues, so, so I, 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 I don't have any faith that, that the, the self-identified uh, left media uh, are, so, um, I mean, it, it is a bit surprising if right wing papers, um, but um, I, you know, so but my my main concern about the the, the media is that um, uh, I mean it would, it would be it would be great if they served as a vehicle for getting out a pro animal message. I I, I I'm my concern is the, the prior one about the extent to which they are serving as a vehicle for the government's or industry's message that animal rights are terrorists. Because I, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, maybe I'm overacting, but I, I look at my, my students at Queens, I mean, they, 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 they have this sense um, that, um, uh, it reminds me a lot of, so I, I was an undergraduate in the early 1980s, and you know, we all had the sense that the RCMP was keeping files on everybody. And it really would kind of had a chill about which which petitions you would sign, which protests you would go to, because this was you know this was for those of you who are old 
if you'll remember, this was just uh, right after the revelations about all the uh, uh, abuses of um, by the RCMP. And so, but I, I, I get that's that's I feel the same chill on, on the part of my students that that um, that they, they feel if they're associated with the animal rights cause that they're. they're Some, some list and you know can monitor it and it's gonna affect their child chances and so on and um, and, and so that's that that um, uh, I mean and, and you know people report these anecdotes about how basically just kind of this gossip circulating about this and you avoid this person because they're the animal rights person. Um, and so I, and I think I think the media is complicit in that. I mean to a different degree of but yeah. I can find your premise about, I think we should start over, really depressing and a little bit too critical. Um, you, you say that minority causes are targeted, such as halal, uh, shark fin. I think that's fine. It's just one aspect of the global animal rights movement. There are mainstream uh, features about generally accepted practices that Mercy for Animals are doing and bringing into the media. So the mainstream media is taking some attention, but I think the left generally are just too concerned about their own issues. I mean, for us, we're concerned about animal rights. Can we be expending our energy going into all these other movements and trying to convince them and being the lone voice? It makes it quite difficult. So I think maybe it's the media who are not reporting things that yeah, you talk about the left and the right, they're just people who look at the media and hear issues. If they're not hearing about issues, then they're just oblivious. Okay, so, um, so, uh, I, I, uh, so, animal advocacy groups, I do not, I, and I, sh I should have made this clear, I, I don't believe any of the important animal advocacy groups in North America Go out of their way to target minority practices. I, I, I don't I don't believe that. On the contrary, I think that, that they say and they act on the premise that most of the animal abuse that happens in our society is done by mainstream corporations and, and uh, laboratories and uh, pharmaceuticals and that kind of all. So so uh, and, and as you say, so Mercy for Animals is a perfect case. They, they're not targeting. Targeting shark fin soup, they're targeting uh, maple lodge or whatever. So that's so so that, I, I completely agree with that. I um, and uh, and and I'm not suggesting that minorities uh, minority animal practices uh, be ignored or that they get a clean pass. I, I think everybody needs to be held accountable for the way we treat animals. Um, so so no one gets a, no one gets a free pass. Um, what I, what I was saying though was that if if we want to be accepted as a member of the family of social justice movements, and I, I just think that's the only possible route for success in the long term, we need to show that we're um, conscious of the processes by which uh, other groups are harmed, disadvantaged, exploited, marginalized. We need to show that we understand these dynamics and that we're taking them into account in our practices. Um, and so that we need to understand something about how racialization works um, so that when we hold everybody accountable, including minorities, for the way in which they treat animals, that we're, uh, we're conscious of the ways in which that that. Um, that some ways of asking people to be accountable can exacerbate these forms of racialization. We just need to be conscious of it. it, it it's not that there's any magic solution. It, it, these are going to be te they're, got, they're complicated questions. These are difficult dialogues. But we need to be conscious of it. And I think many people on the left think, with some reason, that people on the animal rights movement are just not even thinking about how, what's the effect on people with disability of the way we use the argument for marginal cases. I mean, the very term is so obnoxious. Right? I mean, so, I mean, the, the fact is, a lot of people, a lot of philosophers of animal rights are using objectionable language, uh, and, and, uh, and so, 
because they're not thinking. They're not thinking of them. They're not thinking about. They're not thinking of themselves as a member of trying to be a member of the standing of the family of social justice who should be accountable for the way in which our actions and advocacy of other groups. So I, it's not. So I, I mean, I agree. At the end of the day, we're, we're animal rights people. This is our agenda, and and. And and uh, and I, I agree that in many cases it's pointless. It just keeps banging our head against the wall of other of other left groups. They're just not interested, and it's so. Uh, but but I but I do think that that you know um, there is, there is a strong perception. I mean, this is particularly true in the U.S. for that. I think it's true here in Canada as well. That the animal rights movement is kind of a, it's a white movement. It's a, a, a middle class movement. And, and why is that? It's it's in part because many of the just many of the ways in which we present our campaigns and advocacy just seem just seem staggeringly indifferent to issues of poverty and issues of race and so on. Not that not that I don't think this in any way compromises what we're committed to. I, I don't think at all. That, that was the point of the paper was to say that these concerns do not give us any reason. To back off animal rights principles, it's just it's just rather that um, yeah, this is we should be citizens. We should be members in good standing of a larger family. Yeah. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, you you did suggest that perhaps ninety percent of the source of the ignorance of the animal question is just either the flow of pleasures, or we might generously right. expand that to include uh, this gentleman's yeah. um, version of it, or it could just be put more generally, like, um, a little bit negatively, like, most people just don't care about animals, mm -hmm. or a little bit more positively, like, people on the left are humanist, yeah. humanist, and yeah. that in yeah. full ambiguity, and yeah. um, I, I'm actually wondering uh, about, and I, I hope you don't mind, but I, I'm seeing like a performative element to what you're doing here, and it's, it's, it's very interesting and noble, it, it seems like... <laughs> Really, most people who've embraced animals into their circle of compassion have gone through all the concentric rings of inclusion. They've gone through all the other social and and they've now included. They've gone further, right? And so, part of what you're doing, it's, I'm not saying it's disingenuous, but I think it's it's ingenious. <laughs> is you're you're performing and you're saying we've gone so far that now we're also going to <laughs> generously hat in hand or like mea culpas at our lips, go to the other justice movements who've ignored us and say, what can we, what can we do to help you? Right? So it's like, it's, it's, it's actually, it's demonstrating the generosity of spirit which led you to embrace animals in the first place, that you're now embracing these other excluded social justice movements. I, so I, I, um... I don't, so there's, there's so many things to say. So I'm, I'm, you know, nine times out of ten, I'm just exasperated by my colleagues on the left. I, I so and, and um, so it's nice to come to groups like this, right? So I, it's because yeah. So um, uh, and and I. I I don't want to. I, I really do believe that most of the explanation for why the left resists animal rights is not good faith concern uh, about its potential impact on, on other social justice. And it's just yeah, flow of pleasures or, or humanism in, in, in the sense you've designated. It. And um, uh, and so and so they're not. Then they're not going to be open to to the kind of um, alliance and, and and coalitions and solidarity that I'm seeking. I, um, but uh, okay, so I guess I, you know part of this is is so I have a background. In, so my I, I worked on multiculturalism for years. And years. I still do that, but that was my original. Area of expertise, and so I'm. I'm perhaps you know very sensitive to 
to to mechanisms of of ethnocentrism, and prejudice, and racialization. That that's been my bread and butter for twenty years as a as a philosopher. Um, but in in the United States, in particular, um, this is this is the litmus test for. Um, you know, so so we so we in, in the movement we debate whether veganism is the moral baseline for, for being uh, part of the animal rights movement. Well, in in the United States, to be on the left, the moral baseline is sensitivity to, to race. And that's that's just that is, and so the the single biggest vice for the left in the United States is to act white. That that the worst thing you can do. Uh, from the point of view of the American left, is to act white. That is, that is to act in a way that that uh, uh, unselfconsciously takes a position of white privilege, not not conscious of the way in which the way one acts and speaks uh, is embedded in the position of white privilege, and which operates to reproduce uh, exclusion. And so that that there's a rich and sophisticated uh, awareness and consciousness and debate and deliberation around. Race in the United States, and it's the litmus test for the left. That's, um, and so, I, and I just think the animal rights movement. It, it, it's not that the animal rights movement has deliberately targeted minorities. It's not that at all. It's just that they, they have not met the litmus test of uh, of of being conscious of the ways in which one can quite unintentionally be acting white, acting from a position of white privilege. And but I mean it's. Uh, but I say I, I think the same thing is true with respect to ableism and so on. So I that that's and I think those are those are legitimate questions that that people on the left have of the animal rights movement. Those those are legitimate concerns to raise. Um, and um, and I yeah I, I I I want us to be able to to. Um, to have a good answer. Um, do you think, like in the array of strategies that animal rights people use, um, do you think that partnering or piggybacking on more successful movements like the environment or even like health, like nutritional health, yeah. do you think that, that, that those are bad strategies as well, that they're too like, instrumental, or do you think that they're worthwhile because kind of in the long run they're a bit more uh, well known in society? Uh, that's a very good question. I, I, um, um, what to say? Or are there maybe like other white movements that we don't want to? Well, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Well, that, yeah. I mean, yeah, there are some. There are some pretty powerful critiques of of strands of the. Um, Organic whole foods movement is that that's that's very much a uh, phenomenon, and and also some versions of the environmental movement. I, no, so I, I I mean that's yeah. um so on at one level I think that so I'm actually completely pessimistic about I mean I'm I'm trying one does what one can but I I'm not particularly optimistic about the prospects for the animal rights movement in. My lifetime, I, I think that if there's going to be a radical change, it, it's going to be because of some environmental crisis, and so and I, and I just think it's it's unsustainable to feed nine billion people and eat diet. It's just it's, uh, so so sooner or later the system's going to crash for for those environmental reasons, and it would be good when that happens for us to have some articulated view about what uh, what a plant based alternative looks like. Um, so yeah, I mean most days I I think it's just going to Getting worse and worse and worse until it collapses. Um, but I, I, on the other hand, you know, I the so I'm sure we've all had different experiences about just about trying to, to discuss with. I don't I don't I don't view environmentalism as such as a social justice movement, um, and uh, at least not in the same way. It's not it's not about uh, about helping disadvantaged, uh, exploited, oppressed. Uh, groups, it's 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 a, it's a it's a different kind of movement, for better or worse, um, and uh, so so I, I, I don't actually I, I, the, 
the, so, the sorts of alliances and solidarities I'm imagining around ideas of justice, I don't think easily uh, apply to, to in relation to the environmental movement. Um, but there's also, uh, in my experience, most environmentalists are actually, uh, I mean, unbelievably ready to kill animals. I mean, they're just, uh, just, yeah. um, so, you know, if, if there's an invasive species, kill them. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's like their natural first reaction is just to kill animals. I, I mean, I'm exaggerating a bit, but it's, it's, I, it's, it's really, I, 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 this has come up so many times. Um, I mean, obviously, invasive species is the, uh, well, it's partly around invasive species, but it's also around more general questions about what, what, what environments t t to be unsustainable levels of, of any species. So if they think there are too many deer, let's go get a helicopter and cull deer. Right? It, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's the, the, um, th there's remarkably, remarkably little moral qualms about mass killing of animals in, in the environmentalism. So I, I, uh, that's, you know, so there, there, there's certainly going to be lots of times and places where there are tactical alliances with the environmental I mean, obviously, there are lots of shared interests and lots of times when we work together. But I, I, I don't, I don't find them to be kindred spirits. I hate to say. Oh, sorry, there are other people. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have a similar question actually regarding the relationship between the animal rights movement and the environmental movement. Um, because especially in like the radical circles, like maybe not the Greenpeace or the Green Party or whatever, but. In terms of animal rights, like you're, the Animal Liberation Front, Sea Shepherd, cast as terrorists, but they also tend to have um, their core values like incorporating environmental sustainability. But those groups aren't necessarily sympathized with by other left groups or even like mainstream uh, citizens. Whereas like the Earth Liberation Front or Earth First have these underlying values of respect for animals um, and rights of like animal rights, and they get a bit more sympathy. Uh, in terms of mainstream citizens, then animal rights movements want to incorporate kind of the same thing. So just what are your thoughts on that? Because it's like both are, they tend to be linked together, but the environmental movement has to focus on environments a bit more, so about why they're getting a bit more simply, or? Yeah, well, I, I, I'd be curious to know what's, what's the evidence for the, I, I, um, I mean, so, um, because I know, um, sorry, to add to that, the, the animal rights movement doesn't get cast aside, as you said, as more terroristic, but it was the, the Earth Liberation Front, which does have elements of animal rights embedded in it, that's usually cast as the most significant domestic terrorist in North America, so yeah. but it still has more sympathy than animal rights. Well, so I, I um, yeah, I mean, so obviously both the animal rights movement and the environmental movement, these are huge, big tents that, 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 that uh, and so the, I mean, I'm engaging in massive simplifications uh, in making these generalizations about, uh, I, I, uh, I mean, certainly in Canada today, from the point of view of the government, environmentalist organizations and animal rights organizations are both the enemy, uh, and so, so um, you know, these fine distinctions that you and I make from the point of view of the, the oil industry, where, you know, so, um, I, I, I think that, that um, uh, you know, that, that there is a, obviously there's a, there's a public um, concern for environmental sustainability. People, people care about whether there's going to be a planet for the grandchildren. That's, that's, um, uh, so, so, in, in, so the environmental movement has, has, uh, um, Kind of naturally has has some public sympathy and, and uh, um, I, but uh, it, it would be interesting to see but but as I say I think most environmental organizations are not particularly animal friendly and so just just to clarify I, I mean I think we in the animal rights movement need to be much more conscious about the importance of protecting habitat. And, and, and the ways we, one, one of the, we, we harm animals not just by killing them for food, but also by degrading their habitat. And that's also a violation of animal rights. And 
needed. So I think we need a more environmentally informed animal rights theory. I would also like environmentalists to be more informed by animal rights ideas. And I'm curious by your claim that you think there are some organizations that have made that shift and still managed to, to maintain some degree of public support and sympathy. I, I, I'm the, the yeah, from, from my position, the, the, the environmental movement has not, not yet embraced the, the animal rights to me. Oh, which one? No, I, I take mine back. <laughs> uh, why, why don't we just take all three and then I'll try okay. it. <laughs> okay. Um, my question was aimed at, um, do you think that there might be um, some hope if we were to maybe shift, um, if the animal rights movement maybe was to shift their focus in a way that maybe looked at um, the our perception of of caring about animal rights mere from a perspective of of human society lacking in the ability to have compassion because we have been deprived of compassion. Um, there have been many philosophers who have have who have said along the lines of along this quote that hurt people hurt people. And I'm wondering if because in this time, you know, we've in, in some ways humans we've gone backwards and in forgetting to be able to connect with, um, be able to connect with, um, just you know, showing compassion and extending love and compassion to our fellow human beings, that makes us, it like the hurt that we've experienced as a result of humans being hurt themselves. Do we maybe need to heal ourselves so that we can learn to show love and then we can extend that towards animals and change society in that respect? Yeah, considering that animals can't vote, so what if we find a way uh, in, to put in the Constitution that uh, anything the politicians do wrong, don't vote on a proper and uh, heartfelt manner towards the animal, they should be penalized and find a way of doing that. Okay. It's my comment. Just, I, I like what you had to say about the different social justice movements and then how the animal uh, rights thing is separate, and I find that people in everyday life, like that, aren't activists or aren't even knowledgeable about different issues. Like, if you said that you were interested in this and that, like naming two just social justice issues, you know, they'd be like, "Oh, great!" But if you say, "Oh, I'm interested in this and animal rights, or just animal rights." if that's what you bring up, like, oh, well, you don't care about humans, obviously, you just care about animals. And that seems to be a view of just, like, everyday people, that it's, like, an either-or thing. And, and I guess, yeah, that's more of a comment, just that, that was interesting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, one more, is this a Yeah, topic? okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <Don't hold> us. <laughs> is, is there any chance that you see that the, the, the right can can arrive at the same conclusion that we should be harming animals? Like, is this does this have to be like a political yeah. view yeah. issue, or, or there's a chance that they can arrive at the same conclusion as well? Because there seems to be several examples of the conservative side of um, in the US that are doing pro things to animals, or they are doing for the wrong reasons, perhaps. So, should we consider them always the enemy? <laughs> right. right. Okay, good. So, let me take them in reverse order. So, you know, Matthew Scully was a Conservative uh, American, he was a speechwriter for Reagan, so conservative, um, wrote this book called Dominion, which some of you may have seen, which is a, a very impassioned uh, critique of American society's treatment of animals from a from a conservative perspective, and it's it's very powerful, and and I mean it's uh, he so he uses the language of. Um, uh, I mean, so, so he, you know, he's got these, uh, if you haven't read it, I'd encourage you to read it just because it's, it's interesting, sociologically as well as uh, intellectually. So, you know, he, he's talking about the kind of madness that, that um, so, he, you know, he, he, has, he has a chapter about big game hunting and the development of this kind of global industry that allows rich people to go and, and bag 
uh, you know, the, the, the top five or top ten of it. I mean, and, and keeping score and uh, so and and he, you know, he he views this as a betrayal of uh, you know just fundamental conservative notions of, of decency and and proportion and. Um, and and, uh, and 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 a kind of noblesse of niche towards you know, vulnerable and so um, so absolutely you you can you know um, there, there are paths from the right I I, I find Masvidal the, the most interesting example is um, to to reach pro animal animal friendly conclusions um, having said that uh, I. I do think that um, it is part of, it's one of the fundamental dividing lines between the left and the right is ideas of natural hierarchy. This has been, I mean, you can, you can trace this intellectually amongst philosophers, but you can also trace it in social and social psychology, that people who identify as right as opposed to left is one of the fundamental cleavages of the ideas of natural hierarchy. And so you can be, and, and Scully is an example. You, you can you can be committed to a more compassionate, caring form of natural hierarchy, and if so, you're going to be a critic of, of, of factory farming. But I think animal rights. I think justice for animals is not. I don't, my view of justice for animals is not about having a more compassionate implementation of natural hierarchy. It, I'm, I'm committed to norms of, of equality and rights that I, I, I don't think you can get from from conservative premises. Those are left. Those are left. That is. Um, on, on the yeah, so when people say if you care about animals, you don't care about humans. I mean, th this is this is um, again, this is part of the reason why I'm interested in the left because the the um, uh, it's part of. Again, this kind of intersectional analysis, that, that response doesn't make sense uh, at, at, in general. That if you, if you, so in general, on the, for, for the left, it doesn't make sense to say, you know, if you, if you care about uh, uh, people with disability, that means you don't care about uh, indigenous people. It doesn't, it doesn't even make sense, right? So we don't think of these as zero sum. That's the whole point of the left, particularly once we got beyond Marx's idea that it's all about class. They, they, these, they, they, these are not zero sum. They are interconnected forms of oppression, and we need to fight on all fronts. That's that is the methodology of the contemporary left. We need to fight on all fronts because they're interconnected oppressions. And so, uh, and and I, I and and so. Um, is what may be that the average citizen says, if you care about animals, you don't care about humans. But that shouldn't be. That shouldn't be the instinctive reaction of the left. The instinctive reaction of the left should be to say, how do these, how do these oppressions interact with each other? And, 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 and how, how does fighting one help to support others, fighting others? And we look, we look, that's what the left does. That's what the left is supposed to do, is to look for those interconnections. And, and I'd say that, for whatever reason, it's been short-circuited on the, on the animal question. Um, so animals don't vote. That's right. So our, our conception of, of citizenship, you know, what, you know, the immediate response is, does that mean animals can vote? So our our response is that we need to think about citizenship. That, I mean, I would love to talk about this at length, uh, but just the, the short citizenship is about creating mechanisms for deciding on our shared life together that elicit and respond to the subjective good of all of those who are subject to those shared rules. That's what's fundamental to democracy. That's what's fundamental to citizenship. We create processes by which the rules that govern us all solicit and are responsive to the subjective good of all those who are governed. Voting is one mechanism for soliciting and responding to the subjective good of the governed. But even for humans, it's not the only or even the most important. And if, if the only way we contributed to our shared governance was that every once in four years we marked the ballot, it would be it would be essentially irrelevant. We, we, there's, there's all sorts of ways in which we create mechanisms on a day-to-day -day basis to solicit and respond to the subjective good of, 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 of people who are governed by shared rules. We can do that with domesticated animals. We can create conditions that will allow domesticated animals to express preferences about 
this kind of activity, this kind of cooperation, this kind of friendship. Uh, so again, I, that's another paper. But what, how to create, you know, the choice conditions that would enable domesticated animals to, to to reveal their preferences about what kinds of work they want to engage in. For example, I'm very interested in this question. I, that that it's not going to be by giving them a vote. But it, we can create me decision-making mechanisms, choice situations that would help to uh, elicit and then respond to their subjective good about what kinds of activities to engage in. Um, uh, hurt people, hurt people. So I, this is this is a um, that's a very uh, interesting. Um, uh, th this is one point on which um, uh, I have. Uh, um, I have, I'm agnostic, let's say. I don't, I don't know what to think. So one, one story is, we couldn't, we couldn't possibly inflict this level of suffering and harm on animals unless we ourselves are, um, that this is, that there's obviously some kind of psychological scar, psychological malfunction that is, that is, uh, I mean, it's such a level of such a colossal level of suffering for such bad reasons, for such trivial reasons, that that, there, that, that this you know um, that, that it's, a, it's it's evidence that there's something there's something uh, you know, that, that we are suffering and that we take it out on animals or or that that it's it's um, yeah that we're we're traumatized and, and and we need to heal our trauma. And then, and then we can behave decently towards animals. I, I, I know, I know people who strongly believe that, um, and that 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 we are we are cutting our that, that that in order to sustain this level of violence against animals, we need to be suppressing uh, all sorts of um, dispositions. Uh, you know, th things that should be fundamental to our health. Into our well-being are being suppressed in order to maintain this level. I I, I understand that. I that may be true. I, I on the other hand, I I don't um, you know. The, the, I think the average, you know, I I, I think that 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 um, you know many people who exploit animals um, or, or whose lifestyle. Involves exploitation animals. By all appearances, they're leading pretty good lives. I, I don't. I don't. I don't. It's, I, I have trouble saying they're traumatized. I, they look like they're kind of, they're flourishing. They're flourishing at the expense of others, so it's unjust. But they I think I. You know, a lot of my friends and colleagues and my family members who are who are you know enthusiastic meat eaters. I'd say they're leading flourishing lives, unjustly, but they're flourishing. So I, I and and I I'm I'm skeptical about the idea that I mean I do think it's important to to it's important that we don't present animal rights as only about sacrifice it's only, I, I, that it's only about giving up this flow of pleasures I think it's important to be able to give a positive description of what an animal rights society will look like and that's why I'm very interested in this idea of interspecies sociability. I think we, I think our lives can be tremendously enriched by having just relations with domesticated animals. I do not think it might be a link also too, because a lot of children seem to really have, like they don't seem to really, you know, when they're really young, they can't really tell the difference between their relationship yeah. with their dog. So, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm sorry to cut you off, but yeah, no, no. This is, I'm, this is something I'm hugely interested. In. This is going to be the topic of our next paper. Is about uh, about animal rights in childhood. Uh, you're absolutely right that ch young children take it as axiomatic. They take it as obvious that animals have a will, that they that they that they uh, that they have that they experience they have a subjective experience of the world, uh, that they have preferences, uh, and that they have social attachments, and um, uh, that gets beaten out of them. Uh, and it's very interesting to figure out what exactly is the stage of childhood by which. And so we know, for example, children. If you ask, a th you know, a three-year-old, a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, who's your who's your best friend? Many of them will say an animal. Uh, if they ask, if you ask children, who 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 do they dream about? They dream about animals. They, so animals play this hugely important role in the in the mind of children. 
um, and it's and it's and it's a role that fully that it is fully uh, treats them as embodied subjects in, in my in my terminology. So it, respect, it totally accepts that they have subjectivity and that, that okay, it gets beaten out. Uh, and I'm I'm very interested in trying to figure out how that happens. So how much of that is school? How much of the media? How much of that is parents? How much of that is tied up specifically with the need to normalize eating of meat? Is, is that is that what drives this mechanism? Are there are other mechanisms that at work. I, I so I agree with I, I mean I agree with the fundamental premise of the question, which is that it's the animal rights um, uh, the animal rights position should not be seen as some completely bizarre artificial view that we need to inject, you know, that we need to get people to think of. It's, it's in a way, it's, I, I, at least thinking about the case of young children, it's quite natural for us to think that way. We, I think we spontaneously, at least young children, spontaneously think about, uh, of animals as continuous with us in their good, continuous with us in, in, in justice, and, and um, and so, and, and I, I think the animal rights agenda is trying to restore some of that. And, and yeah, so, and that's it. So, there's just a couple of other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I'm just worried about I'm tiring you out. I'm just getting warmed up. Uh, yeah, tiring to the words, but I just don't want to tire you. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Just a couple more. Thank you. Shows how out of touch we are with. We think that because some of these legal barriers are gone, that racism is over. So <coughs> there is definitely, I don't think it's intentional, but I think there is definitely some kind of ignorance that we might have in our rights movement. But the question is is it wrong to make those comparisons? Right. So, you know, there's a big literature on this. Uh, so, the analogy of slavery, the analogy of the Holocaust. Um, uh, torture, I mean, any of these uh, uh, terms. So, what, what to say? I, I, um, uh, I, so what, yeah, so I think there are good ways and bad ways to use this compare. I mean, that's unhelpful answer, but so what I think it's, it's I think we should absolutely. Avoid the idea of trying to create rankings of moral uh, you know, crimes or, or, or atrocities. I mean, you know, some people, like, particularly those who are inclined to utilitarian calculations, want to be able to, you know, where, where does what we do to animals relate to s slavery or the genocide against indigenous peoples? Or, you know, is it on, is it, we're not, okay, I, I just think that's completely. Uh, strange and unhelpful, and uh, we're, we're not. We should be, nothing, nothing. Nothing beneficial or constructive comes out of trying to. Uh, you know, where does animal fit in the top ten list of atrocities? Okay, so that that's that's pointless. I I, I also think it's it, we should be using those comparisons simply for the purposes of shock value, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, because it, it it just actually provokes the wrong wrong. Reaction, but I do think it's 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 important to figure out what makes this level, what makes um, these kinds of levels of of violence possible. What what are the conditions that make it possible for one group to impose violence uh, of, of such extraordinary magnitude on others? And um, there are. There are similar mechanisms at place that at work um, that 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 explain how it is. So obviously, I mean, you know, obviously, society need, it needs to justify, but it also needs to hide. I mean, so so we've got this strange situation, which on the one hand we have intellectual justifications for our treatment of animals, but but on the other hand, they're so 
patently bad justifications. The, 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 the forms of philosophy we commit are so disproportionate that so we have to we have to hide from ourselves what it is we're doing. Um, and so we so we, you know we have euphemisms and uh, we have literally physically removing you know, uh, but also and so these these are mechanisms that are work at all in all of these cases. And I think it's important to I think that we learn something. It's important to learn from those analogies, from those comparisons. And so, you know, they, so, so David Steibel has his article, I think, about you know, what 44 points of comparison between the treatment of animals and the Holocaust. I mean, it's, it's, but the point is to learn. That, that's, we should make those comparisons if they help us learn something about how justice or injustice works, uh, but not for shuffling. Sure. Yeah. Do you think vegetarian and veganism is just a white thing in in no. America or internationally, or no, no. So, so I, I, so the the the, the perception of um, no, so uh, there are there there are still a few places on the planet where it is uh, where there may be kind of necessity argument for eating meat. We we can talk about where those conditions are, but. Um, for the vast majority uh, of people on the planet, it, um, I don't think there's any longer a necessity argument for eating meat. But, um, so in that sense, I, 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 and I think that justice for animals requires that when, uh, when those circumstances of necessity no longer obtain, that we transition to, to a plant-based diet. And that, that is not just an argument about Canada, that's a, that's a, a response to the to the most lots of animals or wherever they live. But what is but what does vary quite dramatically is the ease or difficulty of making that transition and in particular the ease and difficulty for individuals to make that transition. But both for individuals and, and families and communities and societies. And so I I, I think that that um, the, the perception that um, you know, everybody. If they just, if they just made, if they just made up their minds, everybody could become a vegan. That is, that that rests on uh, 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 access to, to resort. That 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 is that only makes sense from a certain position of privilege. To make that claim only makes sense from a certain position of privilege. But for many people in many parts of the world, or in our society, that it's actually it's it's not it's, it's much more difficult and much more complicated than that. And so, uh, so I I think that um, yeah no I mean I, th I think that the, uh, the planet as a whole our species as a whole we need to transition to a plant based diet but 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 the and that's not yeah so but I, I, I think we need to be very uh, uh, skeptical about the idea that that our you know that, that the litmus test for whether we respect someone as a decent human being is whether they whether they're vegan or not. In, in some circles, I, I, I think we should start. We should start to have those expectations of each other. But for other, in other contexts, that's that's just it's it's uh, um, uh, it's just it's just not attending to the, to the circumstances they're in, the challenges they face. Uh, so, I, I, for those of you, Norm Phelps just you know has got another version of his book, book "Changing the Game," that just came out. Uh, and, and I mean, he has, a, he has a very good discussion about, uh, I mean, just trying to think seriously about the constraints facing many poor people in many parts of the United States trying to feed their family on a minimum wage job. And, and someone comes along and says, you should be vegan. Well, just, I mean, just think for a second what that actually means for that person in that context. It's not easy. Um, and so we, we need to, um, so I mean, I, again, I think, Transition to a vegan diet is part of what justice requires in the long term, but but um, uh, it, we, I, I think we should, we should resist the temptation to make that a long baseline. For maybe um, maybe one more uh, focus question. Uh, I prepare to open the, the apple doesn't fall for our far from the tree that it does. Nonetheless, I was in the library and there's some beautiful children's books illustrated with animals, farm animals, and any chill any child. 
had, you know, usually reads a lot of books with beautiful illustrations. And the animals are always friends with the other animals and so on. And we grew up this way, and I grew up to believe all animals were like that. Like that, I always loved animals. We always had them at home. My family are big meat eaters from Europe. But something happens after primary school, and those children start going to school and watching television. And then they start eating animal, and they disconnect between that beautiful little animal in the farm yeah. book and whatever, yeah. and they start going into that. The problem begins at home. The problem begins in how we're raised. Even the, the family that can't afford to go vegan in the South United States may have a solution. If 10 years before that, those children were brought up to go believe in the concept of a plant-based lifestyle, there you go. There are vegan families in this community. You know, one of them in particular with four or five children have uh, have life, have the ability to self-teach, like they're self-taught children, they teach at home. Why? Because those children would be so out of place in a traditional school here in a first world economy in the city of Toronto with a public and a separate school board system. Now that's prejudice as well. But you know, those children are so... Uh, you know, they're so large and impactive with other children they meet, unquestionably. I know you all know who I mean. The family, he's Rastafarian, he's caught their Caucasian, and those children stay at home. And uh, it, it's, you know, it's quite tragic that those children cannot go and, you know, integrate with the conventional status or the conventional children at school. Um, there, there is a point, though, for that, and I think that's very good. And, and I'm sure for the rest of their lives, those five children will have mates, and they'll just diffuse that, the concept of embracing, you know, animals and life and people, and it's all good. So this has to really be ingrained at a very early age, period. I mean, a lot of what we're discussing are ramifications of the big problem. And the big problem is something that... Uh, you know, could be addressed at an earlier age in life because life is a learning process, isn't it? In a manner. Thank you. Well, sorry, Paul, do you have something to say? Oh, no, maybe we should do it. <laughs> I'm in school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who's the moderator? Oh, yeah. I'm the moderator. You know.